uh, normally people tweet out um, sometimes in the course of this. And if, if you're doing that, we'd be very glad if you mentioned um, uh, us so that we can pick up on it. And uh, our tweet handle is UOE uh, for University of Edinburgh CJS. Um, okay. Thank you very much. And this is the first um, uh, in the season. And I say, Alistair will say a little bit more about that. But I'd just like to um, alert our audience to the remainder um, of the seminars um, up to uh, the winter break. Um, and uh, they are listed there. So we'll be hearing from Tom O'Malley um, on sexual offending cases in Ireland, um, uh, balancing the, the rights of vulnerable victims and, and protections of them with uh, the right of the accused to a fair trial. Uh, Jessica Symes will be zooming in from Boston um, later in the semester to talk about um, the distribution of imprisonment in the US, a sort of spatial analysis. Um, and then at the end, our McCormick fellow, Francis Chapman, will join us. Um, although she's from Lakehead University, so um, another of the Canadian contingent, she's actually here in Edinburgh, um, but we're still doing these seminars online. So that's the, the um, semester ahead. You'll find more details um, on, our, uh, on our website. So just look us up at Crime Justice and Society Seminars Edinburgh. Um, and you should find us quite uh, easily. So I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Alistair Henry, who is our chair for the day. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. And a very warm welcome to everyone uh, to this first in our series of Crime, Justice and Society seminars. It's really great to see everyone here. And uh, I hope you'll be tuning in for, for future uh, seminars in this series as well. But a, a particularly warm welcome to uh, Matthew Light. Um, Matthew is joining us from the University of Toronto, and I'm, I'm delighted to welcome Matthew to this session. I think I first met Matthew at the European Society of Criminology conference a number of years ago, and um, I think... Yeah, I, was, I was just really interested what you're saying, Matthew, about the importance of you know, being in situ for some of the research that you do. And I think great though these Zoom meetings are, I, I also look forward to the time that we will be back in situ for some conferences and exchanges of ideas. Uh, to those of you who don't know Matthew's work, uh, I would recommend a look at his profile page, which is extremely interesting. Matthew studies migration control, policing and criminal justice public and citizen security, uh, primarily in the post-Soviet region. If uh, one undertakes a slightly deeper perusal of his publications, we see a, a, a whole host of really interesting themes that have come up in the context of doing that work, interests in police reform, gun control, gun culture, organized crime, private security, the death penalty, all within this region. He's currently exploring these themes with Anne-Marie Singh and Aaron Ehrlich through a four-year funded project entitled Ukraine Public Security and Transition, where they are examining how Ukraine's political transition and ongoing conflict with Russia and Russian-backed separatists have affected how citizens experience and understand their security environment, and including the police, private security and private gun ownership. Uh, he has published extensively on these topics, uh, including his 2016 book with Routledge, Fragile Migration Rights, Freedom of Movement in Post-Soviet Russia. Uh, but I would encourage everyone to look out for a special issue of Theoretical Criminology due next year, uh, which Matthew is co-editing with Anne-Marie Singh on international and inter-regional comparisons in criminology. For today's paper, uh, Matthew is going to be presenting some collaborative work uh, undertaken with two colleagues that he's asked me to acknowledge in the introduction, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Singh from, the, from Ryerson University and Josh Gold, uh, a visiting fellow at the Canadian International Council. Uh, just a, a quick note on a uh, format. Uh, Matthew is going to speak for around about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, then we will open things up to, uh, to questions uh, after that. We'll have a, a, roughly another 40 or 45 minutes for questions and discussion of, of Matthew's paper. The title of today's paper is Private and National Security, the Case of Estonia. And I will now hand you straight over to Matthew. Matthew, welcome. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for the invitation and the very kind introduction. It's, it's great to be with you, although I, I 
I second the, the wistfulness about not being able to meet in person. And here's to hoping that we'll be able to do that um, very soon. So I'm now going to put up my um, slides. Can everyone see them? Uh, they're visible, yes, thanks, Matt. Great. Okay, so it's it's wonderful to be with you, and I'm I'm very happy on behalf of my two co-authors to um, share this ongoing research, which is uh, like a lot of research was uh, somewhat delayed by the pandemic and all the disruptions it caused. But I'm happy to say it's now under review at a, a journal. Um, I'm sure we will have many opportunities for revision. So I'm I'm very looking forward to very much looking forward to um, everyone's comments and thoughts on ways to uh, refine and improve our our ideas. So um, the title is, of our paper is Provisionally Private Security and National Security, the Case of Estonia. And um, to briefly summarize our goals in this paper, uh, we're trying to answer the question, or we, we began with the question, how do national security considerations influence private security development? And as I'm going to elaborate a bit later, um, we think this is an issue that has not been sufficiently explored in the very extensive, uh, nonetheless, very extensive um, scholarly literature on private security in which uh, Anne-Marie has been uh, contributing for many years and I more recently. Um, and the, 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 the question sort of emerged out of a paper that Anne-Marie and I co-authored a couple of years ago that was um, published in Theoretical, Theoretical Criminology, in which we uh, did a kind of uh, extensive review of literature or, or analytical um, analytical bibliography and, and um, argued that um, the, the, um, the literature on private security um, could uh, engage a new set of questions about um, how private security fits into um, broader political systems, um, the realm of high politics, um, um, the structuring of regimes and international relations. And um, as I'm going to go into more depth on a bit later, um, we, in that paper, uh, generated the hypothesis, or if you will, at least the, the thought that um, there are situations in which um, states are more likely to become involved in the, the management of um, a private security industry. So not necessarily in a restrictive direction, but certainly um, trying to um, shape it more closely than they might otherwise. And for reasons I'm going to explain, Estonia um, uh, appeared to us to be what's what could be called technically a most likely click case. So a case where um, if if we found that um, our um, our ideas were being borne out, that would suggest there is something there. Although I, I hasten to add that this is a one this is a one country case study, and of course we don't claim to be coming to any um, sweeping or, or definitive conclusions. Um, we're going to suggest that um, that the answer is broadly yes. Um, that national security threats and challenges do influence private security development. Um, but as you're going to see um, in the case of Estonia, they did so in ways that were sort of indirect, not always visible, and have now been largely obscured by, um, in some ways, the success of those policies, as well as the range of other policies. And that um, the, the influence is often mediated by other institutional policy choices that may not be directly connected to private security as, as a business or as a, a realm of a regulation. As a secondary finding, uh, we also believe we've, we've identified some factors that tend to reduce the political significance um, of private security and define its scope um, in, in advanced industrialized democracies, such as Estonia. And uh, we therefore think that um, we have um, some ideas to share about um, what defines private security as a phenomenon in, we could say, the global north. So going forward, I'm first going to um, very briefly go through some, some questions that have been covered in previous discussions of private security and introduce our investigation. I will tell you a bit about Estonia and its post-Soviet political trajectory, um, which uh, is not that widely known outside of, um, outside of the region. Um, and I'll share with you what we found kind of puzzling about uh, the, the development of the private security industry in Estonia, which is that it, it went through a kind of often referred a kind of so-called wild west phase in the 1990s when it was very freewheeling uh, unruly uh, partially criminalized and politically explosive and has today become much like the private security industry in any other western european country 
And essentially, um, the rest of the paper is devoted to trying to understand that uh, evolution. We argue that there are four main factors that contributed to um, that result. One is policies the Estonian government undertook to separate private and public policing uh, much more clearly than was done in other parts of the post-Soviet region. Another was an anti-organized crime campaign that limited the involvement of organized crime in the private security industry. A third was a set of uh, ownership and staffing policies enacted by the government about who could be involved in the private security business. And the fourth is uh, what, what might be called a kind of whole of nation approach that the Estonian government has taken to public and citizen security. So here we think about how private security fits into a range of other policies that Estonia has developed to involve its citizens in, um, in, the, in their country's security. So uh, here is where I really wish that Anne-Marie could be with me because she has been writing in this field for many years and it's really only thanks to her that I've recently become uh, interested in these questions and have learned more about them. So I, I apologize if my presentation is uh, not the most rigorous or complete. Um, I think the, the bottom line that we start with is that um, a lot of the literature on private security uh, is, um, is focused on the economic function of private security and how it fits into economic policies or economic evolution of, of given societies and its, its relationship with similarities to uh, conflicts with um, the public police. So there, there are different approaches, um, but one could say that they all, to some extent, uh, or mostly tend to um, group themselves into these questions. So going back to some earlier studies, um, the question about how private security fits into capitalist development. More recently, um, there is a, a rich literature on how um, private security emerges out of the formalization of security practices and how it connects to other kinds of occupations which have a security role, um, as well as, of course, the relationship between private security and the public police, um, to what extent they duplicate each other's functions, are in competition, um, can be brought into some kind of synergies. Um, there is, of course, a very extensive regulatory debate about how we should understand the role of private security in, in, in our civic life. And we can distinguish um, two broad um, schools here, one called the Nobel Governance School, which has emphasized the ways in which private security can make a legitimate contribution to, um, to people's safety, um, and has made the point that, um, I think accurately, that um, security is never fully monopolized by the public police and can't be for many reasons. Um, uh, versus uh, another school in which um, the, the argument may be more that, that private security should be limited and emphasis on the, the, uh, the defining role of public police, the essentially public functions of security provision, and a certain skepticism about um, the extent to which private security can play a positive role in, in a society, or at least needs to be kept in, checked, in check. So um, interestingly, um, one thing that we've noticed is that there is, uh, of course, um, an extensive literature on uh, other related phenomena. So um, there is now a body of literature on private military companies, as well as on the role of what might be called private high policing. So I'm thinking here particularly of the work of O'Reilly, um, uh, looking at how um, private security emerged out of intelligence services and militaries and their operations, including in um, the recently concluded 20-year wars in the Middle East uh, that followed the 9-11 attacks in the United States. Uh, more recently, Dorn and Levy have also done some very interesting work looking at uh, the regulation of private security. Um, and one, one point that particularly caught our attention was that um, even in the European context, where, as we're going to argue, these debates are, seem to be largely sort of um, resolved, um, um, there has been dispute um, within the European Union about whether private security um, should be understood to have a kind of national security function so that, for example, it is permissible for um, states, I think including in this case Spain, to try to limit um, ownership of private security companies to their own citizens. Um, interestingly, the European Union quashed that through one of its directives. And uh, this sort of um, made us think about um, our question, right, which is uh, to what extent does private security actually have some kind of role to play in the way that the state um, provides all aspects of security. So let me focus in on that a bit now. 
So um, we uh, follow the lead of some um, noted scholars, um, such as Loder and Percy and, and my current Canadian colleague, James Sheptiki, who have, who have tried to nonetheless um, frame private security companies in their role in the international system. So to understand policing and security broadly at both the domestic and national levels, and to draw connections between private security um, and um, other um, actors in the state. So not simply public police forces, but for example, their connections to the military, uh, as we already mentioned, intelligence services, and how they might um, be understood to play a role in, in international relations. So um, Anne-Marie's previous work was quite interested in these issues. Her, her dissertation, which then became a monograph and a number of articles, uh, focused on how the South African apartheid regime uh, actually really stimulated the growth of private security as part of its campaign against the ANC and other anti-apartheid forces, um, uh, resulting in a kind of a legacy industry, um, which continued to play a very outsized role in um, South African security policy into the post-apartheid period. And um, as, as she and others have, have described, has actually kind of uh, taken on a rather significant role in, in basic crime control functions, in, even in, in South African cities. So um, motivated by her earlier work, as I said, we're interested in understanding um, the role of political legacies in private security. So uh, rather than simply thinking about how they fit into sort of broad historical patterns of development of the economy, thinking about sort of more medium range questions about how they are connected to political transitions, um, as well as the interests of particular kinds of regimes, their constituencies, how they understand um, their, their, the basis for their power. And as we're going to present in this paper, um, we think that there is a rule, there is a, a question to be asked about how private security fits into um, what might be called a regime survival strategy. So, of course, we're looking at Estonia, but in any, in any modern country or in any modern state, um, we could identify um, a set of uh, principles or foundations that the state sees as the basis for its survival, so to speak, or a threats to its survival. And we're interested in understanding um, how private security fits into that. Okay, so uh, based on Anne-Marie's previous work and our, our paper together, um, for reasons I'm going to mention, um, we, we, have we have hypothesized, if you will, I, I hesitate to use the more positivistic term, but um, we have suggested that, that um, that the state will be closely involved in managing private security development in situations where um, there are strong threats to regime survival that, that uh, generate a kind of focus on all aspects of security, um, whether that has to do with an internal conflict as in South Africa or a strong external one um, as in Estonia. So let me um, analyze that in greater depth. Um, we looked at Estonia because uh, it is not the only case where you could examine these questions, but it is certainly uh, one of them. Um, we also thought about other places where there's a similar kind of um, strong um, national security focus, uh, such as Israel. Um, as I'm going to explain in a minute, in Estonia, the, the question has to do with um, this very small country's relationship with its much, much larger neighbor, Russia, um, its former role as um, an occupied part of the Soviet Union, and uh, its current role as an outpost of NATO to the east with very tense relations with the Russian government. So uh, in some sense, um, the choice of case selection um, was determined mainly by the fact that, that I happen to have some knowledge of this region from my own previous work. Um, I have not done work on Estonia before, but of course it's come up in, in, uh, in things that I have written or read about. Um, in some ways, Estonia is always kind of the star performer, uh, as I'll describe later. It's, it's always understood as one of the most successful of the post-Soviet countries in integrating into European and Western institutions and achieving high levels of economic development and stable democratization. But I emphasize that there's nothing sacred about this choice. There are other cases that could have been chosen. Um, this one seems to fit the bill for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Um, we looked... Um, mainly at documentary sources. So uh, it's surprising how even in, in a fairly small country in a small industry such as Estonia, um, there is quite a wealth of information out there about the growth of the industry, um, government policies toward it, um, and analysis of it in the press. Um, we are very fortunate that our third co-author, Josh Gold, is a native speaker of Estonian and uh, was able to translate a lot of these sources, um, including industry reports and government um, government policy proposals that um, otherwise we would not have had access to. 
Uh, we supplemented these documentary sources with some key informant interviews that we conducted in uh, fall 2019 in Estonia, a small number, but I think with uh, seven, but with, with people who were involved in the creation of this industry and its subsequent uh, regulatory development. So um, let me start out uh, the presentation of our, our, our research by telling you a bit about Estonia, which um, does not does not enjoy the uh, the wide level of knowledge that it deserves to, given its its success uh, and many of the many interesting aspects of its history. Um, Estonia has a fascinating pre-Soviet history. It it is very different from other Eastern European societies in the way it emerged. Um, it was ruled for many years by uh, German and Scandinavian overlords. Um, it is uh, traditionally a a Protestant society with, with uh, very high levels of literacy going back to the 19th century. And um, in the 1920s, um, after it emerged from the Russian Empire, um, it, it became quite a, um, a prosperous and successful uh, European state um, with high levels of social welfare and liberal institutions. Um, uh, unfortunately, Estonia's history entered a rather tragic phase in, in 1939 um, with the Nazi-Soviet pact in which um, Eastern Europe was divided up into two zones of control. Estonia spent the rest of World War II uh, being, being batted around between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. At the end of the war, the Soviet government was able to make good its, its occupation of Estonia, which I refer to as an occupation. Um, not, I'm not making a particular point here. It's that it was never recognized by most by most Western governments or or uh, or indeed most independent governments. So, I will use the term occupation. That's the term the Estonian government uses and uh, most other governments use. Um, during the course of uh, Soviet rule, uh, Estonia was transformed as a society in many ways. Um, of course, by the imposition of a, a state directed economy. Um, also by the um, flight or expulsion of a significant proportion of its own pre-war population, as well as the arrival of uh, a large group of migrants from, from other parts of the Soviet Union who mainly spoke Russian. So today it is a country with an ethnic Estonian majority and a substantial uh, 20 to 30 percent um, non-Estonian, non primarily Russian-speaking minority um, who have uh, experienced some is issues with their legal status, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, Estonia, along with its Baltic neighbors, uh, regained its independence at the very end of the Soviet Union's existence. And uh, since then, um, it's been marked by um, some of the same processes that have happened in other post-Soviet countries, but it's had a distinctive trajectory. So um, like other countries in the region, it um, really experienced a severe economic and political crisis upon independence in the early 90s. Uh, marked by um, the the problems of having to adjust with, to a uh, to a, to to modernize um, a very outdated industrial plant um, to deal with a social uh, economic crisis caused by the failure of many businesses, as well as to essentially recreate this new state. So um, Estonia has been somewhat distinguished from other countries in the region by. A, an economic agenda that is often, uh, I think, inaccurately understood as just pure neoliberalism. So Margaret Thatcher, Estonian style. I don't think that's accurate. Um, Estonia is not um, is not is not really neoliberal in many respects. It has quite robust social welfare institutions, for example. But it is true, and I think this is actually the key point, um, and has been analyzed by a number of political scientists that compared to most post-Soviet countries. Um, Estonia really went very um, strongly in the direction of trying to make privatization of its, of its economic institutions real. So all post-Soviet countries, to one degree or another, um, reduced state ownership of major economic assets. In Estonia, um, that was carried out much more systematically and more determinedly than in most other places. So in particular, it, it didn't just involve sort of privatizing major businesses. Um, it also involved, in many cases, um, um, a really um, shutting down kinds of business that were believed to be non-viable, um, stimulating the development of new kinds of business that were seen as more promising, um, as well as uh, the what's called the policy of so-called hard budget constraints. So um, this means in practice that uh, trying to eliminate any kinds of subsidies to businesses, um, as well as all kinds of cushy relationships between uh, business managers and the state, so the result of these policies was uh, a number of things. Um, one, the rise of a new primarily ethnic Estonian entrepreneurial class uh, in key industries, uh, 
Um, with the result that the, the former Soviet managers of major businesses were um, largely demoted or, or in some cases left the country on independence. Um, it also meant that Estonia, unlike most of its neighbors, uh, does not seem to have a class of what are often called in the region oligarchs, so politically connected magnates um, who have a strong political role that they use to dominate the economy. There's, there's no equivalent figure to that in Estonia. Um, another interesting aspect of Estonia is that as part of this policy of trying to sort of redirect the economy away from uh, Soviet legacy industries um, and capitalize on Estonia's human capital, um, the government has really promoted the growth of uh, digitalization uh, in all kinds of spheres of society, including public administration, um, uh, politics, um, but also to stimulate a thriving um, digital society, including things like Skype that many people don't realize actually were developed in Estonia. Okay, so uh, on the one hand, Estonia um, has been remarkably politically successful. Um, it has uh, had a fairly smooth transition to multi-party party democracy, and it's now attained a standard of living on par with uh, many other European societies. Um, on the other hand, Estonia faces significant political challenges. Um, the, the biggest one is that uh, the relationship with Russia remains extremely fraught. Um, Russia has found it very galling that Estonia and its Baltic neighbors uh, alone in the post-Soviet region, have really escaped the Russian sphere of influence. Um, they are the only countries in that region to have entered both the EU and NATO. Um, if you go to Estonia today, uh, you have, as a visitor, I can say, you have a certain kind of mix of impressions. On the one hand, life is uh, very much like in any other European society. On the other hand, you become aware, if you're talking to Estonians, that there is a certain level of tension there, um, which reminds those of us of a certain age of the atmosphere of the Cold War. So. Um, Estonia has had a number of spy scandals involving Russian moles in the government, um, and interestingly, it has a policy of trying to publicize them. So it doesn't just sort of quietly trade them back. They make a big uh, a big public to do of any discovery of a Russian spy. Um, the border is quite tense and militarized. Um, there have been incidents of uh, kidnappings across the border, um, and uh, this this sense that Russia is not uh, friendly to Estonia and does not really accept its independence fully was really behind um, the drive to enter the EU and NATO. And it has been suggested was also behind the policy of economic liberalization. So uh, not just to try to join these political institutions, but to try to integrate with Europe in all kinds of ways um, and to create a Europe, an economy that was tied into Europe. Um, an example would be, uh, as I'm gonna discuss later, uh, very liberal policies on private, uh, pardon me, on international, mainly European ownership of Estonian businesses. Um, another challenge for Estonia has been uh, its policies on the Russian-speaking minority. So as I mentioned, these are primarily people who, who came or whose ancestors came to Estonia between 1940 and 1990. Uh, Estonia very controversially did not grant them automatic citizenship when it became independent again. Um, it created mechanisms for them to apply for citizenship. Um, many people um, thought that was uh, unfair or at least too harsh. Um, over the years, those policies have been modified. Uh, many Russian speakers have become citizens. Um, some of them are non-citizen permanent residents, some of whom are stateless, um, essentially by choice at this point. Um, it, would be, it would be very unfair to say that the Russian-speaking community is, is in some sense, uh, you know, uh, ghettoized or, or uh, hostile. And there's a wide, there's a rich body of literature demonstrating that um, most of them are, are um, at least understanding of the state, uh, do, not, do not see themselves in opposition to Estonia's independence. Um, nonetheless, this has been a difficult relationship. Estonia is essentially a, a binational society, like, like Canada for that matter. So I, I can compare the situation to that of Quebec, right? A, uh, a community that needs to be integrated with special, with special institutions. Um, and uh, there is a related question about sort of the economic role of the Russian speaking community. Um, so as I mentioned, the transformation of the economy tended to re result in the promotion of um, uh, mainly Estonian entrepreneurs and a certain kind of demotion of Russian-speaking managers. All right, so this is the background, and we were expecting to find that Estonia, because of its uh, fear of Russia, um, its memories of a long-term traumatic Soviet occupation and all the rest of it, would be very closely involved in managing its, its security industry. And uh, initially, we found out that it doesn't really seem to be the case. 
um, if you actually start to look into the Estonian security industry, which I, I'm, which not too many people have done, uh, there have been some studies of it. I should probably have mentioned those in my uh, initial slides. Um, I can go into that later if people are interested. Um, it's one of the smallest in Europe. Um, it, it looks like that of any other European uh, security industry um, with a, on a sort of miniature scale, Estonia itself has a population of only 1 million. Um, there is a mix of small local firms and major European ones, such as G4S. Uh, the, the, European, um, the European firms tend to dominate um, the larger prizes in the security industry. So the, the, the major customers, um, they're more likely to have uh, access to, um, to armed guards. Um, the business is primarily in guarding of sites and objects, as well as some uh, technology sales. Um, interestingly, uh, despite Estonia's thriving cybersecurity uh, business, which I'll come back to later, um, we discussed the trends in this industry with um, the confederation that, that um, unites uh, major businesses in it, which is called ETEL. And the chairman of that uh, federation, um, you know, was, was quite, um, um, did not see major opportunities for growth in this field. The, the, the business is, is small. Um, uh, Estonia does not have a significant crime problem. Um, there are not a lot of major firms that would require a large private security contingent. So the trends in this industry, industry have been mainly flat or even mildly declining. Um, there are some reasons to think that there could be expansion in some limited areas, which I'll come back to. Um, likewise, the regulation of private security industry with in Estonia is, um, as Anne Marie has um, has has concluded, and I'm I'm following her on this, is largely within the European mainstream. Um, so if you come out, if you come into this um, analysis looking at having looked at say the UK or France or Germany, um, you would think there's nothing going on here that's particularly interesting. So um, the, the Estonian industry is um, constrained from guarding, from providing any kind of policing function in public spaces. It is limited by a special act to guarding objects um, or protecting people um, or controlling private spaces. Um, it is quite limited in its use of firearms. So, so firms uh, may uh, have access to firearms, but there is a, a dual licensing requirement. So both the firm itself must be licensed to provide firearms to its staff, and those staff have to be individually licensed. Um, there have been some proposals for, uh, for growth or for relaxation of policies uh, coming from the industry itself and, with, and viewed with some interest by the government. So Estonia um, has some problems of under-policing in rural areas, and some rural municipalities would like to have the opportunity to contract with private security for their policing needs. Um, the Industry Confederation Etel has proposed this to government. Um, there have also been some proposals from the Confederation to, um, to deregulate or, or uh, soften the regulation of some aspects of regulatory functions. So, um, for example, um, security audits, they would like to be, to be essentially de-licensed. They would also like to have control over their own training and not have that conducted for them by a government ministry. Um, but the overall picture is a small industry, stable, a limited range of functions that is quite consistent with the European mainstream, regulatory policies that are not that controversial and again are within the European mainstream. Okay, so um, we initially were a bit disappointed because this wasn't what we thought we were going to find. Um, now, however, the picture changes when you adopt a longitudinal perspective. So let me take you back on a journey in time, roughly 30 years ago, to the period known as the, um, the Wild West of Estonia and its private security industry. Um, it's hard to believe now, but in the early 1990s, Estonia was a, a rather rough place um, with uh, skyrocketing levels of homicide, um, an active organized crime scene that was connected to uh, the, the broader post-Soviet and Russian organized crime scene, um, as well as to uh, the KGB and other post-Soviet intelligence agencies. Um, the initial emergence of private security in this industry, now coming to this from some as someone who's looked at security issues in other post-Soviet countries, what immediately struck me was that while Estonia's contemporary reality looks much more like, say, the UK or Sweden or France, 30 years ago, it really looked a lot like um, other parts of the post-Soviet region that it belonged to, in the sense that you see private security um, emerging in this kind of uh, contested, messy way um, out of uh, former public agencies, including the police and the intelligence services, um, with an undefined role 
that was partially blurred with organized crime. So um, we discussed, for example, we, we spoke to um, a man who had been the head of the security department of the National Railway, and he describes an environment in the 1990s in which there are multiple firms offering uh, essentially uh, what, what amounted to is essentially protection rackets, right? So they were describing themselves as private security, but it was a lot closer to an extortion racket or a protection racket in which uh, it would be paid off to uh, not to harm you or to, um, to keep other, to keep other uh, violent actors at bay. And uh, that was also connected to other kinds of demands for sort of um, for cheaper for for cheaper services or other kinds of uh, organized crime activities such as um, uh, fire fire sale prices of assets. So um, this is the environment in which uh, Estonia's private security is emerging. Um, there was also even a kind of higher state level. There was a um, kind of lack of clarity, shall we say, about who was really in control of force in Estonia. Um, there was a significant incident called the Jaeger incident in which a group of nationalist militia were uh, mutinied and had to be suppressed by the army. So uh, this is a moment in which Estonia's security institutions are, are in ferment. Um, its survival as a state is not assured and private security is not fully distinguished from um, public institutions, as I'll come back to in a second, or organized crime. Now, a particular Soviet legacy that we see all over the other post-Soviet region um, is something that's called in English the guarding police. And that is essentially a branch of the national police um, that offers private security sales on the, on the security market, um, the offers private security services on the private market. And the interesting thing is that um, we see this everywhere in the region today, or I shouldn't say everywhere, but in every country I've studied, there is something similar. And what it means is that the police are both a public agency, but they're also, they're also available to be hired. Um, and this has been written about by other scholars. Um, for example, in the context of Georgia, um, the government essentially um, deliberately um, subsidized and supported this uh, guarding police and uh, kind of stunted um, the private security industry of that country. So there was something similar in early Estonia, um, a guarding police, uh, police officers who hired out uh, who could be hired uh, institutionally for private security. So what we're going to see in the following slides is how Estonia somehow got from point A to point B. So somehow from a very post-Soviet reality of uh, blurred boundaries between the state, organized crime, and private security, and a high degree of contestation of the role of private security to the, the point B, where private security has a defined limited role and is not seen as politically threatening. So um, summarizing a lot of data, I'm going to break down these processes into a certain number of, a limited number of policy choices made by successive Estonian governments since the 1990s, um, starting with um, what I would call disintermediating the public police or public security from private security. And here, very early on in the game, uh, Estonia decided that it would abolish the guarding police. So um, this is a contrast with, for example, um, the country that we're that Anne Marie and I are looking on another project, Ukraine, um, there is a robust public public policing role in private security that persists to this day um, in Ukraine. And it involves um, other activities of public police, um, such as uh, sort of private detective work uh, that blur the boundary between legitimate security functions and um, forms of coercion and organized crime. So the availability of police to be hired to sort of do Oppo research on other politicians or businesses that you'd like to um, that you'd like to bring down. Uh, Estonia didn't go that route. They said no. This is not an appropriate role for public police. Um, there should be clarity about what is a public function and what is a private function. Um, why they did this is actually kind of interesting. The, the, the explanation that was given to us in our interviews was that it was essentially legally required that Estonian the Estonian constitution did not permit um, permit uh, a public entity to provide public private services like this. At the same time, um, you know, one can ask whether there was a certain kind of underlying policy preference um, to uh, deliberate policy, perhaps preventing the kind of extortion rackets that I just described, um, as well as maybe a sort of ideological preference to keep pri private, private and public actors separate. Uh, I can't fully resolve that. I can only say that the, the legal argument that was used also um, seems to produce the same outcome. Um, another pillar of uh, Estonia's policy on private security 
um, if you want to put it like that, or policies that have influenced private security was disintermediating or disintermediating or constraining organized crime. And here I would make the point um, that this really doesn't have to do with private security in some sense. It was really about dealing with Estonia's organized crime problem. And I think there's a lesson here that I'll come back to at the end of the presentation about the ways in which other policy areas influence private security development. Um, those of us who are familiar with the organized crime scene um, you know, have thought about the ways that organized crime is connected to private security. And the post-Soviet region, of course, is a premier example of this. So as I mentioned, um, it's surprising today, um, but in the early 1990s, um, Estonia had a very robust organized crime scene uh, linked to actors in the rest of the post-Soviet space. Um, unlike uh, another country that's been studied a lot in the region, um, Gavin Slay's work on Georgia, um, where there was a very extreme anti-mafia campaign um, involving um, expulsions, expropriation, and very harsh draconian uh, criminal justice policies, Estonia seems to have focused on a policy of institutional reform, and they, they particularly addressed um, two institutions they thought were, were sort of gateways to organized crime, um, the revenue service and customs agencies. Uh, as I understand it, they were basically purged and reconstituted. Uh, this is a story that's worthy of a separate investigation. I think it's quite interesting how the Estonians adopted what's often called a kind of a situational approach, right, to re reduce the incentive, to change the incentive structure in a way that makes organized crime more difficult to carry off rather than the more punitive approach that Georgia tried. I don't know exactly why they did that. Um, but the result, according to, according to studies that we've examined, and here we're, we're drawing primarily on the secondary literature in our interviews, is that it's not that Estonia has no organized crime scene. It's that it's now been separated out from the larger post-Soviet organized crime scene. Um, its ability to, to liaise with them and engage in extortion rackets has been reduced. Um, there is still smuggling. Of course, there are still illegal businesses. Um, there is still organized crime violence. Um, but this, the sector is reduced in size. It has been um, severed some partially from its post-Soviet connections. Uh, it's not capable of playing the same kind of role in Estonian life that it once did. Um, or of interfacing um, with the Soviet, with the Estonian security services. A third area of policy evolution that we think contributed to the taming of private security was the regulation of ownership and employment um, by the Estonian government. And here there's a range of policies, um, some of which, again, are um, not particularly linked to, or not specifically linked to the private security sector but all of which tended to produce an outcome in which um, the, the business is dominated by actors that the Estonian government regards as politically reliable. So first of all, um, ex-KGB officials and Soviet police were not barred from, from participating in private security, uh, but they did have to go through a vetting process and they seem to have been somewhat marginalized in this business. So um, some of them still own small private security businesses, but they don't dominate the sphere. And um, they're actually some, somewhat less represented than you might have thought. I guess, of course, um, 30 years have passed since Soviet rule. There's been generational turnover, but um, people from this background now seem to be a fairly minor part of this business. Uh, interestingly, non-citizens were barred from employment and ownership of uh, certain kinds of businesses initially. Um, uh, so that meant that um, you could not be a non-citizen uh, guard, I think, at the same time, Estonia also uh, was very open to international ownership of private security um, as part of its broader policy of ownership, of permitting ownership by, um, by foreigners of all businesses. So if you go to Estonia, most of the banks are Scandinavian. And similarly, even before Estonia joined the EU in 2004, um, they had a policy of just allowing uh, widespread ownership of, of Europe, uh, businesses by European firms. But that included private security, um, and we think this is significant for two reasons. So what all of these add up to is they tended to push out people who the Estonian government regarded as hostile to Estonian independence, so um, former Soviet officials, and replaced them with Estonian entrepreneurs or uh, reliable Western foreigners. And um, that produces an industry that is more politically legible and, and safe from the government's perspective, uh, and also means that in some sense it's its capacity to challenge the government is, is limited. And the final and very interesting piece of the puzzle is what we might call Estonia's security ecology. So here it's nothing about 
private security per se, but more about how private security fits into a range of other institutions and practices. So Estonia still has conscription. Um, they're not the only European society that does that, but it's clearly a minority phenomenon at this point. Um, more to the point, Estonia has a number of policies that really aim at trying to involve citizens in, um, in um, aspects of public security. So uh, there is an institution that has been widely studied called the Estonian Defense League, which, which is essentially a kind of reserve force um, that on a day-to-day -day basis involves its, its members in training, including with weapons. Um, they can be mobilized for disaster management, but in the case of a war, they could also be mobilized for a national security service, essentially as kind of adjunct to the military. They cannot perform policing functions um, such as arresting people, but in, an, but in a national emergency, um, they could be used for guarding sites. Uh, they also have special access to weapons, so they're allowed to, um, they have a special licensing regime which allows their members to, to acquire weapons more easily and to store them um, at home. And speaking of weapons, Estonia also has, um, in, the, in an EU perspective, a fairly, a quite liberal, um, and also compared to post-Soviet countries, quite liberal gun policies, which, um, as they were explained to us, also explicitly aim at kind of making Estonian citizens feel like they have a role in, in security. So Estonia, um, quite early on in the game, um, legalized private possession of handguns for um, self-defense. Um, that does not mean that there is no that it's uh, free for all. There are quite strict uh, licensing rules um, and storage rules, but nonetheless, um, there is interest in sort of there is certainly an understanding or a view that um, citizens citizens' use of weapons it can be harnessed to the, the greater good um, to the defense of Estonia. Um, there is actually discussion underway about how this can be formalized. So perhaps to have a kind of um, Swiss model in which reservists keep their weapons at home. Um, that's still in progress, so I can't say much more about it. But why is this significant? Well, I think, um, as it was explained to us, part of what it means is that private security is sort of in the shade of this security forest, so to speak. There are other institutions and practices that are just more important. Um, the Defense League is uh, a, a force that is controlled by the government through the military, um, that, that is armed, and that really reduces potential um, risks posed by by um, private security. And as a corollary, also in some sense, all of this means that private security is just less interesting. So you kind of get the sense from um, the way the government treats private security that's become an afterthought. It has its limited role to play, um, but it is not something that the government is trying to integrate into its, uh, its uh, very extensive understanding of how security should be provided um, for the state or for the Estonian people. Um, as an interesting coda here, Estonia has also become kind of a leader in cybersecurity in both public and private spheres. So um, oddly enough, Estonia in 2007 became the victim of the, the world's first known cyber attack against a sovereign state. Um, this followed an incident in which the, so the Estonian government had uh, attempted to move a, a monument to a Soviet soldier known as the Bronze Soldier, um, which triggered uh, riots, which apparently had some um, involvement from, from Russia. Um, this was in 2007. It was it was a, a rather alarming incident for the Estonian government. Um, the cybersecurity industry had already developed in Estonia, but this was an additional impulse to it. Um, Estonia is actually the the NATO center of excellence for cybersecurity defense, so that's based in Tallinn, the capital. And one interesting aspect of this is um, a drawing on the work of O'Reilly. Um, you can really see here. So O'Reilly has written about how. Um, certain kinds of uh, public um, military and intelligence operations um, create the possibility for uh, high, high policing, private high policing. And we see that here with Estonia's cybersecurity industry, which has partially emerged out of the public aspects of cybersecurity. Um, so um, Estonia has become a leader in certain kinds of aspects of cybersecurity and it's, uh, Estonian firms are, are widely respected in this market. Now, there's a very odd contrast that we think is significant with the main private security industry, which has been, as we just described, kind of segregated out from public security, um, has been not allowed to participate in public security functions. And interestingly, it doesn't really seem to be that interested in getting into the in cybersecurity business. Um, these are different groups of people with different kinds of professional backgrounds. Um, the the, the, the uh, Security Confederation does not seem to see cybersecurity as their natural domain. Um, so we think there's quite a, a sort of un, a striking contrast between the way that the Estonian emphasis on public cybersecurity has generated a, a private industry 
and the kind of um, limited sort of in the shade role for the for the main private security sector. Um, so what do we make of all this? Well, I think that um, that with all the usual caveats about this being you know sort of a one country study and um, a fairly new uh, and, and, and intervention of this literature, I think what we have uncovered is evidence uh, that not that national security considerations don't influence private security development, but that they do it in ways that are not um, as obvious um, as you might think, right? So um, clearly in the case of the sort of um, private security consultancies that people like O'Reilly have studied, you can see a very direct kind of connection. That's not the case here. We think something different is going on. Um, what we see, and I think this has emerged out of the presentation so far, is that in a lot of cases, the industry has been shaped in Estonia by high level decisions taken early on in the game that either had a, a limited connection to the industry or that were about something entirely different. So in some cases, the spe specific aspects of regulation were adopted for the industry, but in other cases, such as the crackdown on organized crime um, or the, um, the limitation on the, pub the public police role in private security, it seems as though what the government was concerned about was something entirely different, right? So they were not trying to design a particular kind of, of Estonian private security industry. Uh, at least that's not all they were doing. Um, so what we think, I guess, to put it to put it sort of in the simplest terms, is that you need to look at how the Estonian how the security industry is shaped by other high level policy decisions, which which do clearly emerge out of so, sort of high politics uh, national security considerations. So the emphasis on limiting contact with Soviet entrepreneurs, the emphasis on uh, sort of removing former Soviet officials from the market, uh, connecting with European um, with European partners. Um, uh, all these things sort of tie in very nicely with the broader higher level policies of Estonia, which are to integrate as much as possible with EU and NATO countries and to limit their connections with Russia. So in some sense, the kind of very modest debates that are taking place in Estonia today about whether private security should be allowed into some aspects of public security that it hasn't been able to go into for now, uh, you know, sort of show how little is on the table. In some sense, what's left for debate is not that much. Um, and that leads us to, you know, I think uh, a related point. Um, we also think that in addition to kind of helping answer the question about how national security frames private security, we also think that we have something to say about how, um, in general, a global north industrialized democracies structure private security industries in ways that are different from probably most other countries in the world. Um, and we basically think that that the 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 mechanisms that I've just identified, those sort of four mechanisms, um, we would group them into two kind of broader processes, to use a technical term um, from the political science literature, which have to do with basically constraining private security, um, limiting its act, limiting its activities, uh, limiting its connections to the political realm and also embedding it in other institutions that, that are more important and that kind of overshadow it. Um, I, we, we tend to think that there is probably something to, to there, but probably if we looked at other global North countries, we would see that these processes have already taken place. So to go back to the point that I made earlier, why is it that Estonia's security industry now looks so much like Western Europe? Well, we think that essentially it's the result of these processes. And the uniqueness of Estonia is that these processes have, has, have unfolded in a fairly short historical time frame that we can that we can view, rather than kind of already being there, right? So the, the Estonian state is now up and running. It's it's basically addressed its initial security and economic uh, restructuring questions. Uh, these issues were sort of resolved earlier in other European societies, and that's why we can see this happening in Estonia, whereas it's no longer visible in other parts of Europe. Um, it does have to be said that one distinctive aspect of Estonia is the, the emphasis on the security ecosystem. So clearly, um, most global North countries do not have anything like the Estonian Defense League. That is a distinctive feature of Estonian society. So, um, you know, we can't fully disentangle the significance of each of these uh, two processes. Uh, clearly, they work in tandem. Um, it seems likely that 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 they can interact in all kinds of ways that um, that um, you know, the, the mechanisms that sort of uh, constrain private security um, play an important role as well. Um, so uh, we do think that there is some possibility of transferability from Estonia to other to other cases. And I might add that um, you know one policy implication that I've considered for from this from all this is that you know if you go to Ukraine, which has been working on police reform for the last um, eight years, um, 
this issue of the, the, private, the private guarding police um, has really not been on the table at all. They continue to perform their functions. And I think Estonia actually suggests that um, this is an issue that should be framed, confronted squarely, right? That the need to sort of remove the public police from private security to create a kind of basic principle that public police are not, um, are not there to provide private protection. Um, uh, it's interesting how little that seems to have, uh, message seems to have resonated elsewhere in the post-Soviet region. Uh, we think it probably is a policy that, that could be examined by other countries in, in not only that region, but other countries in um, some stage of political transition. Um, finally, I think um, a few methodological points. So as I just averted, averted to, I think, you know, there's a role, uh, you know, the question of what's on the table now implicates a kind of a need for a longitudinal analysis. If we just compared Estonia with, say, contemporary Belgium or, or, or Canada, it would not look that different. It's really only by, uh, by analyzing its trajectory that we saw what was unusual about it. Um, we also think um, that, 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 you know, what part of what Estonia suggests is that there are new questions to be to be asked based on new cases. So um, once you get away from the traditional Anglosphere um, cases that dominate the literature, um, you see entirely new questions, and you also see how um, questions from the literature don't always very well, apply very well. So um, the nodal government governance anchor pluralism debate um, in the West, in you know our part of the world, uh, for Estonian people, that's just not really relevant, right? I mean, they both have a strong ideological insistence that there should be a private security sector. Um, and they also have, at the same time, a very developed sense of um, kind of how security should be understood in its totality. Um, so um, I think, you know, this point to kind of a need to like be sensitive to new questions emerging from new cases and not just testing out old questions on new cases. Um, I would also like to acknowledge sort of what, what we think we have and have not done. I think, you know, we have that our study does help move forward some scholarly debates about how high level politics influences not secu private security. Um, at the same time, what we don't answer in some sense is why did all this happen? The meta question of why did Estonia do this? Uh, I think that that is a separate question that we don't need to answer to achieve our goals in this paper, but it's nonetheless worth acknowledging. So um, there is a sense in which, as I've already you know, pointed out, that Estonia's private security policies are kind of in line with a lot of other policies that adopted. And Estonia is in many ways kind of outlier. So um, why is it such an outlier? That is a complicated historical question. Um, one point that's been made is that Estonia had a kind of very unusual relationship with its neighbor, Finland, which is a culturally similar um, neighbor that uh, kind of shepherded it into the EU and was very influential in influencing its um, many aspects of policy, including private security. Um, Estonia also has a, uh, a very, um, a, a particular uh, Roman German legal tradition that may have influenced how um, private security was understood. Um, we're not in a position to answer those questions. They're certainly worthy of study. I would just say that they're they're separate from the questions that we've tried to address in our paper. Okay, so um, thank you for your uh, attention to that. Uh, I hope uh, interesting, but I'm afraid rather dense presentation, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you so much. That gives us a a, a huge amount to think about and uh, discuss. So I, I would just like to immediately open things for questions. It, just, just before I do, can I quickly ask Andy, what is the best way of, of people raising their hand in the Zoom system? Uh, thanks, Alistair. Yeah, um, so for anyone that's not familiar with it, down at the um, bottom right of where you see Matthew's slide, there should be a little happy face saying reactions. Um, and if you click on there, there should be a, a raise hand oh. button. I'll just do it as an example now. So you, you see beside my uh, picture there that um, there should be a little raised hand. Um, so that's one way in which you can attract Alistair's attention. That's wonderful. Th no, th thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. So just what I'm going to suggest is if, if anyone would like to uh, pose a question to Matthew, please raise your hand. I will do my very best to keep an eye on when hands uh, come up. Uh, again, if, if you're comfortable when, uh, and when posing a question, please do feel free to pop your camera on. Uh, but if, if you would prefer not to, uh, then that's also fine as well. So just, we are open for questions. Would anyone like to start? Yes, uh, Sapna. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. And thank um, you, Matthew. That was extremely interesting paper. It's not the area of research that I do, but 
uh, I do have some questions out of curiosity if you let me uh, ask you those questions because I work on rule of law and I'm aware of Martin Mendelsky's work uh, in um, Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania where he talks about how the elites within Estonia and Latvia they try to exclude um, the other elites who were much more closer to the Soviet Union and because of excluding the other elite groups they could get a consensus in terms of the policies that were that they were taking yeah. so in that direction i did wonder when you were saying that uh, the estonian government tried to ensure that there were politically reliable factors when they were identifying private security firms to take on some sort of you know maintaining order uh, yeah. functions um did you get a chance to look at who owns these private sector companies and kind of what kind of areas that they work on? Because you also mentioned that there is a defense league, because I think from what you what you were presented, I felt that it's not emerging out of distrust of giving more responsibility to the public um, national security force. It's something else that is motivating uh, the, the state government to allow private security funds to take in security yeah. roles. Um, so I was just curious. I know that this yeah. is probably not your angle. It's, no, it's. I mean, it's a great question. Um, we have thought about these issues, and we did. We did have. I can add to some things in the presentation about that. I, um, you know, I think that running through all these issues is the question about sort of the role of um, Estonia's connections to Russia, but also its own Russian-speaking minority and how they're integrated right, into Estonian society, the partial way they've been integrated. Um, I mean, you know, having visited Tallinn, uh, you know, I it, I was kind of reminded of Montreal in Canada, right, where you go there, French and English speaking people interact, but you also get a sense of distinct communities that are not really that intimate with each other. Um, so, you know, to go back to your question, um, the Defense League, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's no secret about it, like it's overwhelmingly ethnic Estonian, you know, it's, it's mostly male, as you would imagine, right, so it's, um, you know, it does have, you know, there does have some Russian speaking members, um, more Russian speaking people are now Estonian citizens. And, you know, I want to emphasize like <clears throat> that um, there is, there is abundant research to indicating that Estonian Russian speaking people are not a fifth column. And I don't, I don't want to involve, you know, get, make, I don't want there to be any kind of shadow of doubt that I'm suggesting that they're disloyal, right? Like these issues have come up because of the, the Ukraine question and, and particularly the annexation of Crimea, but you know, all the research indicates that most Russian speaking people in Estonia are happy to be in Estonia and, you know, think it's basically an okay country. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not aware of these sort of, you know, issues about um, inequalities as well as their own kind of role as a minority and that they're not, you know, that they feel about Estonia the same way that, you know, Estonian people, Estonian, ethnic Estonians do, you know, in the same way that French Canadians don't have the same attitude toward Canada as a state that, you know, Anglo Canadians do. Um, so, um, you know, in that sense, it's not that surprising, right, that the Defense League is primarily ethnic Estonian. Um, um, and, you know, I, I, would, I think it's probably a reasonable inference that, in some sense, um, the government likes, you know, likes the fact that its, its primary constituencies are mobilized in this way, right? And, and um, that doesn't mean they're trying to keep, you know, non-Estonians non out of the Defense League. I, I think, you know, they welcome them. But um, you know, it, it's a reason. I, I don't have a I don't have a firm answer to your question. I think it's it's a fair question mm -hmm. about the private security industry. You know, what we were able to glean is that most of the larger firms are now Estonian owned. Um, there are you know there are some mainly smaller firms that are Russian owned. As I said, the proportion you know partially just through the passage of time, partially through active policies, partially through immigration. It seems as though the role of former Soviet officers is now quite limited. I mean, that's maybe also just generational shift. Um, you know, as a counterfactual, um, we, we, you know, we, one thing we say in the paper is, if you can imagine an Estonia in which the private security industry was dominated by non-ethnic Estonians, right, or, or people with a Soviet security background, that would be a much more politically threatening industry, right? That would be an industry that the government kind of had to think about a lot and, you know, and would be probably very interested in regulating closely. So um, I think, you know, what we see now is that, um, you know, for other reasons entirely, um, they recreated this defense league, which, which is, you know, dominated by people who are very patriotic and loyal to the regime. And they have a security industry, which performs a fairly minor function in their society, 
and which is also dominated by ethnic Estonians and, and wealthy foreigners whom they regard as their friends, right? So um, I should say that I, you know, we have not uncovered any evidence of current overt attempts to prevent Russian speakers from entering this business. And many of them are employed in it. So, I mean, I think we were told that, you know, um, half the workers in the sector are Russian speakers, right? So they seem to be concentrated more on the staff side rather than the ownership side. Um, there's also a fair number of Russian Russian speaking people in the police. So they're not, they're not absolutely not being kept out of these uh, security sector businesses. Um, for a variety of reasons, the top the top echelons are dominated by by Estonians, um, and you know it's um, uh, you know we can ask to what extent that's intended, or at least is a result that's very congenial to the government. And yeah, that's does that does I mean I've I've done my best with that question. I think it's a very very fair one. It's a complicated one though. Yeah. Thanks very much. Great question, Sapna. Uh, Andy, I see your hands up. Uh, yeah, I found that uh, an excellent paper. So um, thank you very much, um, Matt. Um, I think kind of what I, I want to ask is, um, I was really pleased when you said you were taking the, the longitudinal approach. I thought, yes, because the, the, the kind of um, simple, this is how it is now. I think that that left lots of questions around how did it get there? Um, and I was interested that you, you kind of found ultimately that it's these early institutional choices um, that were actually about other things that seem to be one of the big driving factors here. But I was curious, you, did, you didn't frame this as a kind of historical institutionalist study, but it kind of screams out um, critical juncture to me that decisions are taken for particular reasons earlier on, which may not yeah. be directly related to the phenomena that you're looking at, um, but because they're taking earlier on and there's kind of feedback loops and various things happen, they have a kind of quite significant long-term um, cumulative effect. So one of the questions that I had in mind was whether that was a, a framing that you um, weren't mentioning for particular reasons at the moment and, and, and what those are, or if it's something that you see some kind of merit in terms of how your work kind of complements some of what the historical institutionalists are doing. And then maybe to kind of push a little bit on that with um, something that you acknowledged when you were speaking about driving factors. And you said it, it that the, the narrative that you were getting at the beginning was that it was the kind of part of this was coming from the constitution. Um, and it, it it was equally credible to kind of thinking about it in ideological terms or, or kind of other terms. And I just, uh, this is a, a I guess, a, a kind of a factual question. I, where was that constitution from? Is that an old Estonian constitution or was it a kind of um, transfer that they were looking to emulate? I mean, I, I know you've, you've kind of recognized the role of Finland as kind of trying to support Estonia through some of its changes. Um, can we learn anything by thinking about the, the roots of that constitution and how that is one of the kind of major institutional choices at the beginning has, has kind of shaped um, what's happened, even though it wasn't targeting the private security industry? Yeah, great questions. So uh, on the first question, I have not been shunning that terminology or that approach. Um, I, you know, I think I've sort of been inchoately thinking about it, but um, your question makes me think we should actually make it explicit and, and you know, engage with the concept of a critical juncture. Um, my only quibble with it would be, I mean, there's a sense in which you can see a particular historical period as a critical juncture, right? The, the early 1990s when these major policy decisions were made. Um, you know, I, can I turn the question back to you? I mean, can we talk about a critical juncture when we are looking at sort of, I mean, what you get out of the story, I hope, is like a range of policies that are not sort of being thought about into the context of creating a private security industry, although they have, they, they sort of shape it, right? And there are policies on all kinds of things like, you know, trade policy, institutional reform, you know, national security, they're all connected in the grand scheme of things, but they're all kind of being pursued independently. Um, can we talk about a critical juncture, you know, when, when, sort of what, when, it's, when what is actually being decided is so diffuse? Can I ask you that question? I mean, what do you think? Um, I love it as a question, um, and <laughs> not not working predominantly within um, within this frame. I don't know whether it's something that is already being taken on board by by people yeah. speaking about critical juncture. But I think that is a. I mean, I think there is certainly a 
I like the idea of, of the, the diffusion. I mean, I think there is a sense in the critical juncture literature that things are, um, the consequences are, are generally unintended. And I yeah. think that fits with this idea of, of kind of quite a diffuse um, situation. And it may actually help sharpen some of the analytical tools in, in, in historical. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think it's I think it's definitely worth acknowledging that we are framing the kind of argument and that it has that connection to that literature. Yeah. And it, it might make a, it is. might it might make an extra strand to your contribution. Yeah, um, if, if there's a chance to kind of draw it out. Yeah, I mean, I I'd love to think more about you know how the critical I, sort of my my uh, sort of untutored understanding of that is that you, you're trying to focus on a particular moment, right, or a particular major decision. I. I will be interested to learn. I mean, I clearly need to go back and look at this literature. It's been some time since I engaged with it at all. Like the extent to which, you know, it, it is understood to apply to kind of uh, a more expanded moment with a multiple with multiple sort of uh, things going on. But I, I very much take appreciate the point. Um, your other question is also great, and I, I tried to kind of um, anticipate at the end there when I talked about what I think we have answered and what we haven't answered. And you know, I mean, I was thinking about this and. If you had asked me before I did any of this research, uh, which post-Soviet country do you think has the private security industry that's most like Western Europe? I mean, I would just say like, well, obviously Estonia, because everything there is most like Western Europe, right? And there's a sense in which it's really overdetermined, and that makes it very hard to answer um, the question you're asking, right? And for anyone to kind of disentangle all these strands of causality. So, um, you know, um, the connection with Finland is very strong. I mean, Finnish and Estonian are closely related. Like these are countries that are have historically been, you know, be, except for the Soviet parenthesis, been very closely connected. Um, the 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 initial private security act that was first adopted by the Estonian government, uh, this is a great story, was basically copied from the Finnish act and was brought over from a securitas uh, vinyl vinyl securitas bag, which is you know preserved in some you know memorabilia chamber of the Estonian. Um, Security Confederation, I believe. So there is a sense in which um, you can sort of see institutional borrowing very directly there. And I, that's a, a very important point. And I, I don't quite know what to do with it, right? Like so many things pushed Estonia in this direction. And there's also a subsidiary question about, well, if they hadn't taken that act, would it have mattered that much, right? I mean, like it, they would have just, they would probably come up with a law that was not that different or maybe, right? So, you know, one can say that even within the Baltic region, the Finnish connections, the connection with an existing EU member, was much clearly much stronger in in Estonia, right? And and you know its security industry, its police, its organized crime problems look different to the limited extent that I'm aware of them from other from the other Baltic states. So that would be an argument that the Finnish connection was really important. Um, your other your other question about sort of where did this constitution come from? I mean, it's a very astute question. So as it was explained to us, or you know, as, you know so. Estonia, when it, it, it when it became independent again, its position was we were always independent, we were just occupied, and therefore our, our 1938 constitution is still in effect. And as we have been told, it was that constitution that was interpreted to mean that the public police should not um, perform a private policing function. Now, there was now another constitution in effect that was adopted after independence was restored. But this is sort of a pat, this is sort of a pat statement that's given out when you ask this question, right? And and um, I do wish we'd kind of dug into that deep, more deeply. And, and you know, again, I, what can I say other than that? It seems to cohere with all other, with all these other sort of policy objectives and assumptions. Does that mean it was just a pretext? You know, I, that would be, I, I don't have evidence to support that, right? Does it, but could it mean that this is kind of what these people already think about things? Um, I mean, I think there is there is a really interesting point here about the cultural significance of private security in different settings. I mean, you know, this is not something that, and then in Western countries we're used to, but if you're a post-Soviet person, the idea that, you know, that um, the public should only provide security has a slightly different connotation, right? That 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 sort of, you know, makes you think about um, police, police organized crime nexus, um, police protection rackets, um, scary officials who are collecting dirt on you and, and, and blackmailing you, right? So. Um, there's a sense in which you, you, you get the impression that Estonians were kind of influenced by their post-Soviet context to sort of have a wish to kind of keep the public police out of things that they shouldn't be involved in, which is in a way, you know, very different from the debates that we're used to in, in you know, Canada and Western Europe. Um, so, I, I mean, your questions are great. I, I can't fully answer them. I think um, this is why I feel like we have done, what I think we've done in this paper is to more sort of identify mechanisms that explain the evolution 
uh, you know, of the private security industry and its connection to these national security issues that face Estonia. But we we can't really claim to have answered the question like why did Estonia do all of this, right? It's it's a very big question that I'm also not enough of a scholar of Estonia to really feel comfortable taking that on. I mean, uh, you know, the, the Finnish connection, the the legal culture issues should be investigated. We're just not in a position to to, to form firm decisions. Yeah, but I think if I, if I may, I, I think as well that in in answering some questions, maybe not answering others, you throw up the the absolute methodological challenge of of um, answering them because you you might say well process tracing would allow us to attach this to kind of changes in the national and sec national security environment but the very answer about diffusion and over determination yeah I think show you just how difficult process tracing yeah. would be I mean they're they're too confounded right I mean I think that's the term right I mean you know to use the positivistic language of variables like there's so many independent variables they're highly confounded like and you know um, like on, on a sort of at instinctive level, it just seems really important that that Estonia had this Finnish security policy brought over in the Securitas bag. But then you could sort of ask, like, well, how much does it really matter anyway? Um, you know, is that just a cute story? Um, so, um, yeah. Thanks very much, Matthew, and great questions, Andy. If there's no one, just for the moment, I, I might ask uh, perhaps some. It's more observations and perhaps quite naive ones because I. I don't have good knowledge of, of the region that you've been talking about, Matthew, but I find that the, I found the title extremely interesting of you know, private, you know, private sector national uh, security interests. So also maybe as a bit of a follow on to your point mentioning that, you know, the, the particular cultural significance of private security in different settings. I think yeah. there's also obviously a particular cultural significance of uh, public and state security in particular settings yeah. and for the the whole idea of anchored pluralism it relies on a certain legitimacy of the state and or the public policing sector and so, so I, what, I, what i thought was fascinating about the paper and the, the discussion of the the wild years of the the 1990s was the the ways in which private security seemed to have been quite heavily stigmatized in that yeah. period you know, associated with things like organized crime and I wonder if you've any observations about, I mean, did any of that stigma attach itself also to, you know, public security? And one of the reasons I, you know, it's on public police. And one of the reasons I ask is, is kind of about the governance arrangements, because in a, some countries, the, the public police have actively tried to play quite a large role in the, the governance of the private sector, whether providing training or a, accreditation or these kinds of things. And I wonder if, if, if that, has that been a part of the, the landscape in, in Estonia? Have the, have the public police had that kind of level of legitimacy? Or, and I suppose my, my, my not very well thought out questions are really ultimately about what is the contemporary relationship between public and private? Are there moments at which they intersect and cooperate or are they actually working in quite different or, or distinct spheres? And that really is a, a final observation is that I think sometimes it's assumed that, the, that, that an increase in private security can be to a, a, a reduction in the power or authority of the, the public mm. sector. But actually there's quite a lot of literature suggesting that actually uh, a savvy state and public sector through contract can use the private sector to extend resources and capacities for you know, national security and issues. So you raised yourself the issue of um, some concerns about under-policing in, in rural areas. Well, you know, could that be a driver for a, you know, a fairly neoliberal approach to you know, contracting the private sector to fill that security gap that the public yeah. sector have been un unable to fill? So sorry, a few um, related things. No, no, those are that's really those are really interesting points. Um, uh, there were a lot of them. I'm sorry. Could you maybe just remind me which one? That just <laughs> uh, so, anchored pluralism and yeah. this idea that you kind of you're kind of reliant on a semi-legitimate state. Or yeah. Public okay. State. Right. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah. I mean, I think a couple of things. So. Um, I did. I, I I think I didn't maybe go into much depth about this, but Estonia did actually. You know, another thing about Estonia that's kind of unusual in the region is it actually really took on its police and justice institutions quite early on. And again, that's connected to kind of 
the desire for a clear break with the Soviet legacy. So um, there was an essentially kind of, uh, if not a purge, at least a very, very careful vetting and lustration of those institutions. Um, and I think, you know, most people in, seem to think that they function fairly well. So, um, you know, levels of corruption are not any different from, you know, from those of Western European countries like, uh, like Estonia, like every other society has corruption problems. So an example would be, um, I don't know whether you heard about the Donsk, the Donsk Bank scandal a few years ago. So one of these, one of these large Scandinavian banks that's active in Estonia to be essentially being used, I think primarily by, by Russian investors to illegally um, circumvent various kinds of sanctions and international financial rules to, to uh, inter insert or inject Russian funds from Russia into the banking system. So that was, you know, like that kind of tarnished Estonia's image is, you know, Mr. You know, squeaky clean, right? Um, but sort of on a day-to-day -day level, um, these institutions seem to have um, been been effectively, you know, restructured early on in the post-Soviet period, and to be quite analogous to their Western counterparts. I mean, I, I do think um, there's not much more I can say about that. I, I'm not I feel like I don't want to go out on a limb talk too much about Estonian police. Um, I, I think the other point is also very important, sort of, you know, what, how people perceive the relationship between these institutions. It's, it's very clear that the Estonian government, it makes no secret about, I mean, it has official policy statements that they wish to involve citizens, yeah. in, you know, public security, right? And, and the Defense League is an expression of that. And um, there is a certain kind of, at least among the ethnic Estonian community, sort of, uh, I think a more pronounced wish than you see in most European societies or Canada for sort of like for citizens to have this role. Um, and, you know, in terms of like how they all fit together, um, from what we can see, just as in most other Western countries, you know, there is a kind of a process of, um, you know, former police and military going into private security. Um, they don't seem to be in conflict. Um, so it doesn't, you know, the, the private security in Estonia is just not Big enough or scary enough to intimidate anybody, um, you know. This debate about the debate about sort of use of private security in rural areas is happening. In a way, it's possible because, I mean, the premise for that is that private security is not threatening, right? So, you know, there's still a question that you asked about. Well, well, why don't we just you know give rural areas more police, right? Um, I, I don't understand all the ins and outs of this debate. I think you know their their perspective or the industry's perspective is like, look, if certain finite resources have been made available to these municipalities they want more, why shouldn't they be able to like buy more, you know, and, like, make their own decisions about how they spend their money. Um, you, know, you do see that the fact that there's resistance to that on the other hand suggests that again, like there is a certain kind of fairly strong official kind of uh, assertion that the private sector needs to be kept within bounds. Um, you know, whether that's um, a, a post-Soviet legacy, whether that's an aspect of um, the Roman German legal tradition, like, you know, one thing I didn't go into a lot of detail about is that the whole Estonian legal system is based like other civil law countries on kind of over nested conceptual categories. And they've had a hard time defining private security, right? Because it's both a business to be regulated like other businesses, but it's performing things that are a public role. Um, so until now, the sticking point has been precisely should private security be allowed to begin policing public areas, right, and perform performing police functions, the answer has been no. Um, Estonia is conducting a security review, um, you know, to try and modernize its security institutions, and that might result in this, this, me this measure being adopted, which the industry confederation is pushing. Um, but, um, you know, they, they don't seem to be, I guess the short answer to your question is, there is no kind of evidence of like cross-colonization or conflict to be what we see in, in Western countries. Um, there are the usual debates about role delineation, but not more than that from what I can see. No, that, that's very, very interesting. Th th thanks very much, Matthew. I see we, we are actually almost uh, out of time. We're approaching half past five, but um, are, are there any final questions that anyone would like to, to quickly put to Matthew? We have a couple of minutes if uh, anyone would just like to sneak in a, a quick observation or question. Not for the moment. Well, I, th I think you've given us just a, a huge amount of things to, to think about, Matthew. It's a, a fascinating area of work, and I will certainly be uh, looking out for the publication and the, the special issue of theoretical criminology um, 
coming out next year. Thank you very much for uh, the paper and for your very, very you know, uh, detailed and rigorous response to the, uh, to the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, if I could just ask everyone to, as Andy is doing, perhaps to, with reactions, give a little uh, virtual, virtual clap. Uh, really just to, to, to wrap up and say thank you very much, Matthew, for a, an excellent paper and very much appreciated. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been my pleasure. It's, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to share our research with this, uh, this audience and look forward to, to meeting again in person before too long. Absolutely. I, I very much look forward to that as well. That'd be great. Hope, hopefully the ESC ne uh, next year, perhaps. Yes. That'd be great. <laughs>